A report on ag biotechnology and a look back at the Sunbelt Ag Expo. Those stories, farm markets and agro weather for this Monday, October 24th. Good morning. This is the Agribusiness News Leader, the Morning Ag Report, with Wayne Jenkins and Brian Baxter. Good Monday morning to you. Welcome to the Morning Ag Report. I'm Brian Baxter. And I'm Wayne Jenkins, and we hope your weekend was a good one. And Brian, this week offers some unusually different weather possibilities in that uh, east of the Mississippi River, it just may very well be cold and wet. It may indeed, and we are going to have a look a little bit later on in our weather uh, portion at the weather outlooks through this coming Saturday. All right, and uh, first let's uh, have a quick swing through some of the stories making our farm news headlines this morning. Though the severe summer drought may be over, subsoil moisture levels remain critically short in many states. Farm income may reach a record level this year, but farmers without a crop to sell will see a big drop in their income. And Iowa Senator Tom Hartkin says the 1985 Farm Bill has been a bad farm policy. We'll have full details of these stories and more a little later on today, but right now, Brian starts our market check. In the last couple of days of last week, Wayne, were some bad ones for the grain markets. On the Chicago Board of Trade last Friday, grain futures ended the week on a lower note as professional and commercial hedge pressure pushed the values downward, going through their technical support levels. Some of the pressure in the corn futures trade came from rumors that the Soviets had rejected a U.S. shipload of corn that contained aflatoxin. The rumors continued that the Soviets turned to Argentina for corn buys. For last week overall, nearby corn futures were down 10 and one quarter cents. At the Friday close, December corn futures were at 283 and a half. That was off two and three quarter cents. March corn lost three cents, ending the week at 288. And May corn futures also fell three cents to finish the week at 290. Trading in the soybean complex last Friday was influenced by the harvest in the southern growing regions, where yield prospects are better than they were in the Midwest. For last week, overall, nearby November beans were off 25 and one quarter cents. And at Friday's close, November beans were at 774 and three quarters. That was down nine and three quarter cents on the day. January beans closed at 789. That was down eight and a half cents. And March beans dropped nine cents to end at 7.99 and three quarters. December soybean meal lost five dollars Friday, ending the week at 2.50.70. And December soy oil lost 29 points to finish at 23.63 cents. In the wheat trade at Chicago last Friday, wheat futures, after gaining some early support in the trade, crashed in the late part of Friday session. And the nearby wheat contract for the week overall was down nine and one quarter cents. In the Friday trade, December wheat futures were off four cents at 4.19 and a half. March Chicago wheat down five and a half cents at 4.22 and a half. Kansas City December wheat futures dropped uh, four and three quarter cents, finishing at 4.10 and three quarters. And Minneapolis December down three cents at 4.11 even. At New York, cotton futures closed in a contrary fashion to the other commodities Friday, scoring a sharp rally. About the only influence in the cotton trade for the rally was heavy short covering going into the close. At the bell last Friday, December cotton futures were up 124 points at 55.44 cents, and March cotton gained 127 points to end the week at 55.55 cents. So we went sharply lower in the corn, the soybeans, and the wheat last week, Wayne. Right. Well, at uh, Chicago last Friday, on the mercantile exchange, a lot of the... Uh, Traders were just twiddling their thumbs, <laughs> waiting for the uh, catalog right. feed report to come out. And at the Merck uh, last Friday, the livestock futures did close mostly lower. Uh, most of the traders were simply on the sidelines, waiting for that catalog feed report. In the report, which was issued after the close, the 13-state report placed catalog feed at 95% of a year ago. The trade expected 95.1%. Uh, cattle placements uh, were pegged at 90% of a year ago figures. The trade guess was 89.4%. Marketings came in at 102.6%. The trade thought it would be 101% uh, on the nose. The trade reaction to the report was neutral. Now, for the week, nearby Chicago live cattle were down 33 cents on the Friday close. Uh, December live cattle were at 74.42. That was up 17 cents. But February live cattle were off 15 cents at 74.75. 
November feeder cattle down 18 cents at 82.52. Cash cattle market steady, very light test. Both Illinois Direct and Interior Iowa steady at $71. Friday slaughter, 128,000. Slaughter for the week, 638,000. Chicago live hogs were on a downslide in the last part of last week due to weaker cash prices that fell below the 40 cent mark. For the week, uh, the nearby live hog futures dropped a dollar eighteen, and on the Friday close, December live hogs were off thirty cents at forty one eighty seven. February live hogs slipped a dime to finish at forty five seventy seven. February pork bellies, based on a neutral cold storage report, gained seventy cents and closed at forty nine sixty two. Cash hog markets ranged from steady to down a dollar and a half. Omaha off a dollar and a half at thirty eight fifty. St. Paul down a dollar and a half at thirty seven fifty. Uh, Friday slaughter, 327,000. Slaughter for the week, 1,661,000. In the sheep markets uh, last week, 90 to 120 pound shorn slaughter lambs ranged from 63.25 to 67.50 at Midwest market centers. At Oklahoma City, 45 to 70 pound feeder lambs brought from 69 to 75.25. Sheep slaughter last Friday, 19,000 to kill for the week, 96,000. And on Wall Street, the Dow Jones Industrial Average closed last Friday at the highest level since the great meltdown of a year ago. The Dow ended the week at 2183.50. That was up 2.30 points for the day. Volume, 195,410,000 shares. The gainer, 745. The losers, 683. And the NYSE index ended the week at 159.42. That was up 4.10 points. Today's morning ag report market update and analysis was prepared by Richard Brock and Associates. Still ahead this morning, we'll have a report on ag biotechnology. And up next, a report on last week's Sunbelt Ag Expo, along with the rest of the Agri News. Now our report of the latest Agri News on this Monday morning. As we move into cooler, wetter fall weather, the drought may seem a memory, but experts say many states are still critically short of subsoil moisture. Iowa State climatologist Harry Hilliker said his state will need about 12 inches of precipitation between now and next April to bring subsoil moisture back to normal, and average Iowa precipitation for that time period is only 7.5 inches. In Illinois, about 11 inches of precipitation is needed between now and next April. And in Indiana, the moisture needs range from 6 to 10 inches to bring the subsoil moisture levels back to normal. In all states hit by the drought, subsoil recharging over this fall and winter will be critical for next spring's planting. Well, despite severe crop damage caused by this year's drought, farm income this year remains strong. Uh, that according to a USDA report last week, which said that 1988 uh, net cash farm income may equal or exceed last year's record of $57 billion. The USDA report said higher commodity prices, stock drawdowns, and only a moderate decline in government subsidies will keep 1988 net cash farm income in the range of 55 to $60 billion. However, that rosy outlook masks some serious problems for many drought-stricken farmers, those who escaped drought damage this year may see a sharp jump in income, while those with heavy crop losses or faced with sharply higher feed costs may be hit with a steep decline in income. Well, in Washington last week, Vermont Democrat and Senate Ag Committee Chairman Patrick Leahy said that unless the European community agrees to begin working toward cuts in farm subsidies and ag trade barriers, then the EC will face a major farm trade war with the United States next year. And Leahy said it is a war the U.S. would win because its treasury and its ability to produce, distribute, and market farm goods exceeds that of the E.C. The Vermont senator said if the Europeans don't budge, the U.S. Congress will get tough in the 1990 Farm Bill, a measure he said the Congress will begin to write early next year. However, Senator Leahy would not say what direction the 1990 Farm Bill may take, and it may partly depend on whether George Bush or Michael Dukakis wins the White House two weeks from tomorrow. But at least one Democrat on the Senate Ag Committee plans to push for a shift to a supply management farm program. He's the co-author of the Harkin-Gebhardt Farm Bill, Iowa Senator Tom Harkin. The concept behind Harkin-Gebhardt is as strong as ever. 
The concept behind it is to get farmers money from the marketplace and not from a government paycheck. That concept is strong. Now, how you exactly do it has to change with changing times and changing circumstances. I believe I can make a very strong argument with my graphs and charts here that had the Harkin Gephardt bill been enacted in 85 instead of the 85 farm bill, farmers and rural America would be in a much better situation than they are today. The Iowa senator predicted the Harkin Gebhardt bill will be born again. And although many Republicans and Democrats in the Congress have praised the 1985 Farm Act, Senator Harkin said it's a bad farm policy. I believe there are new ways, new ways of addressing the problem of, of, uh, of supply management in a way that doesn't have one foot on the accelerator and one foot on the brake which is what they've got going right now with this program. It's a wasteful program. It's a program that really doesn't uh, get farmers a fair return. Uh, and it's one that's just costing us a bundle of money from the, from the Treasury. Harkin was critical of farm policies during the Reagan years. He said 240,000 farm families have gone out of business since President Reagan took office in 1981. Farm families who are at least six months delinquent on low payments, loan payments to the Farmers Home Administration are going to get a chance to have their loans restructured. Now, sometime between November 14th and Thanksgiving, those families will receive a letter from the FMHA giving them 45 days to request new rights to loan restructuring. Uh, those rights were mandated by Congress in the Agricultural Credit Act of 1987. Now, if farmers reply within 45 days, they have a chance to submit what is known as a farm and home plan. If they don't, they'll lose most of their rights under the new law. U.S. farm exports made some big gains this year. For fiscal 1988, which ended on September the 30th, U.S. farm exports are estimated at 146 million tons, a 13% gain from last year. And the value of those shipments hit $34 billion. That's a 21% increase from last year. Well, the 11th annual Sunbelt Ag Expo was held in Moultrie, Georgia last week. It's the South's biggest farm show, drawing tens of thousands of visitors to learn more about what's new in farming. And from Georgia, Joe Corson files this report. The Sunbelt Agricultural Exposition includes the usual. Thousands of people looking at all types of displays and hundreds of different pieces of equipment. But this year, the show went to the dogs. The North American Stock Dog Trials were held to find out which dog could herd sheep the best with $3,000 worth of prize money at stake. Roger Foster of Conyers, Georgia, came to Sunbelt just to watch the dogs work. And uh, I have an interest in that uh, I've got a young dog that I uh, am trying to start to train, and I wanted to watch these dogs run. <laughs> Besides stock dogs and farm equipment, Sunbelt added a hunting and fishing area where Gerald Collins of Soperton, Georgia, wanted to learn more about deer hunting. This Noel Feather, he's one of the best deer hunters that, that I've heard of in the whole United States, and I got a lot of confidence in him. And these calls, a lot of people have been killing a lot of deer by using calls. Sunbelt officials added a special area this year dealing strictly with hogs, and one couple came to find out all they could about the animals. Jerry and Charlotte Sellers of Pavo, Georgia, decided to try growing real pigs in their spare time. Pigs have kind of been a hobby with me for a long time. I've collected ceramic ones, and now I'm going to have some real ones, and I'm excited about it. For the Morning Agriculture Report, I'm Joe Corson reporting. Well, coming next, a report on ag biotechnology with some ideas on how biotech will impact farming. So don't go away. Some say agriculture new age, a time when biotechnology will bring rapid improvements in crop and livestock production. And the experts say one of the first areas where biotechnology will be used is in the crop seed industry. At the very beginning of a very exciting, challenging ride in the seed industry, and it's going to happen. Biotechnology and genetic engineering are sciences that allow researchers to manipulate plant characteristics in the laboratory. Some say biotechnology is wrong, that it's tampering with nature. But Dr. Hayes doesn't see it that way. 
Ever since man has been on the earth, we've tampered with nature. If we didn't tamper with nature, we'd still be living in caves and going out and shooting, uh, you know, buffalo or whatever it is. Man has tampered with nature, uh, largely beneficially, ever since he appeared on the face of the earth. And all we're bringing to this industry is what has been brought to many other industries. For example, uh, I dare say in the Garden of Eden they didn't have motor cars, they didn't have motorbikes, they didn't have television. And man has always strove to improve life for himself and his fellows. And that's what is this process going on here. And it's inevitable. And if we don't do it here, if it's not done in the United States, if ICI don't do it, other people will. And then we'll be playing catch up all the time. So I think we owe it to ourselves, to our community, to our company and to our farmers to keep up with the hunt. Last week, ICI's Garst Seed Company opened a new $5 million bioscience laboratory near Slater, Iowa. The goal is to apply sciences such as gene transfer and tissue culture to the breeding of new hybrid seed corn. And company officials say ag biotechnology will benefit farmers. We will see varieties which will do better under stress conditions which have been experienced in the Corn Belt this year, yes. Whether it's drought or water stress, we're going to see varieties that uh, are able to withstand cold at the wrong time, or we're going to see varieties which are tailored to these farmers' needs. Uh, we expect uh, genetically engineered corn to be uh, on the market in the early to mid-90s. So I think that uh, the iceberg is starting to move and that uh, it's just a matter of a few years until the farmer actually sees what we've been talking about. Overall, the ICI company is spending $800 million each year in agricultural research. Coming next, we'll have the farm weather outlooks for the rest of this week, so don't go away. Farming and ranching weather this week, uh, Brian, it's a split decision. It is indeed. Uh, the long-range charts on the jet stream indicate much of this week's weather in the eastern half of the country will be coming from Canada. The full push of the colder air doesn't show too much on this morning's low temperature map. Freezing line runs from near Iron Mountain, Michigan to Rapid City, South Dakota, then dips into southern Co or central Colorado and then northward through Montana. At the other end of the scale, South Texas and Florida are in the 60s as dawn breaks. The weather map for today does not indicate much precipitation in the west, except for a few showers stretching from Washington to the Idaho pipe stem. East of the plains, however, field work will be chancy. Recent rains and the possibility of more will slow activities. Colder air in the northern Rockies and plains will require attention to livestock, and livestock producers east of the Mississippi should prepare for colder temperatures and greater than usual rains near the last of this week. You also need to check soil temperatures in the Midwest before applying nitrogen without inhibitors. And here's a look at high temperatures for today. They'll be in the cool 40s from eastern North Dakota to western New York. The 80s will be found in the far southwest, southern Texas, and south Florida. Wayne, how about the latest Palmer map? Still unfavorable in a lot of areas, Brian. Uh, the Palmer index of drought severity in the deeper soil still indicates uh, extreme dryness in central Washington from eastern Oregon and northern Nevada to Minnesota with smaller, extremely dry areas in the northwest Corn Belt, a small portion of Ohio, and the border region of Tennessee and North Carolina. Those are the brown areas. Orange areas, moderately to severely dry. The green areas indicate ample deep soil moisture. Now, this map does change slowly, so it'll take a lot of rainfall to get it back into a near-normal uh, condition. And uh, the uh, little improvement that has taken place in the extremely dry regions just indicates that we need the rains and snows. Here's the temperature outlook. Uh, from tomorrow through Saturday, normal temperatures will stretch north-south in the central U.S. The western one-third will be warmer than normal. The east will be cooler than normal, above to much above in California. And the Carolinas and Virginia will be much colder than normal. Precipitation from the 25th through the 29th will be on the scarce side. Now, New uh, York, New England, the Delmarva, New Mexico will be wetter than normal. And Michigan, the southern Atlantic coast, Nebraska, central Rockies, Idaho, Panhandle, and Washington will be near normal. But the rest of the country, including the Delta, Great Plains, Winter Wheat region in the west, will see little or no moisture. Now we'll pause for some local forecasts and conditions.
And that's the farm weather for today. That's all for this Monday edition of the Morning Ag Report. Thank you for being with us today. I'm Brian Baxter. I'm Wayne Jenkins. Have a great farming day.